I did a presentation in Oxford years ago, and Richard Dawkins turned up with his friend Douglas Adams. Douglas Adams was a mad fan. They consistently denied it over the years. I mean, if anything is really true, it's going to go through fire and hot water to get there. It would be lovely to confirm the aquatic ape hypothesis because it's such an interesting and fascinating idea. I think we have most of the evidence. Everything is there. There's only what we need is a switch in, in the minds of the people. There is no real alternative anymore to the water side theory. A lot of what you're doing when you're sprinting in cold water is you're watching what's going on with your body. So a lot of the time I'm watching my hands and trying to figure out if I'm holding my fingers together because if they're splaying apart, that means that I'm not pulling water, but it also means that my brain's cooling down. And if that happens, that means that um, I'm in, in the midst of hypothermia, which is really dangerous. Lynn Cox, a legend in the world of long-distance swimming, recalling her historic swim from Alaska to Russia in 1987 across the Bering Straits. The water was barely six degrees above freezing. Lynn completed the extraordinary swim in two hours and six minutes. What's perhaps more extraordinary is that she did it without a wetsuit and without the lanolin grease that channel swimmers typically cover themselves in to keep out the cold. But Lynn, although exceptionally gifted at endurance swimming, is not unique. Long-distance swimming is a sport in which women are unusually well represented. Over the last hundred years, women such as Florence Chadwick, Penny Dean and Alison Streeter, amongst others, have regularly held the world records outright, both for men and women. It's been suggested that it may be because women have a slightly thicker layer of body fat than men, making them more buoyant in the water, as well as better insulated against the cold. Humans are truly remarkable animals, able to achieve an incredible range of feats, from swimming to Antarctica to climbing Everest. But there are also things that we can't do. It may sound obvious, but we can't fly, for example, like birds and bats, and we can't hibernate like bears and hedgehogs and many other mammals. And though we can run fantastically long distances, our top speed is somewhat less than a rabbit. Most four-footed animals will leave us for dust. But we can swim and dive underwater to considerable depths, holding our breath for upwards to six, seven, eight minutes. For a largely land-based animal, this might seem a curious set of skills. Why and how? did we acquire them. In these two programs, we'll be looking at a theory of human evolution that has confounded scientists and provoked continuing controversy for more than 40 years. It's been called the aquatic ape hypothesis. Regrettably, the, the name is its own worst enemy, I believe. That's what makes people laugh. Let's just talk about water and human evolution. Professor Philip Tobias of Witwatersrand University has been a leading light of South African anthropology and fossil hunting for the last 50 years. In 1924, his professor and mentor, Raymond Dart, unearthed a small humanoid skull which became known as the Taung Child. Although it took time to become accepted by the mainstream, that discovery was to turn the story of human origins on its head. The earliest human ancestor was no longer from Java or Pekin or even Europe, as previously suggested, but demonstrably from Africa. Dart's discovery was of immense importance in switching the spotlights from Asia to Africa. The discoveries were found not along the coast particularly, but in the hinterland of Africa. Professor Leslie Aiello of University College London and former editor of the Journal of Human Evolution was raised, like generations of anthropologists, on the scenario established by Raymond Dart. By the 1960s, it was accepted as orthodoxy that the earliest human ancestor had descended from the trees 
and moved out to exploit the wide rolling grasslands. What Dart could be said to have done is establish the savanna hypothesis for human evolution. So you had a rather simple idea that early humans lived in open country, apes li lived in forested environments. And that's gone through a number of changes. What many people forget is that there's a huge spectrum of environmental type in Africa. It's not just you know totally open savanna like the Serengeti and totally closed rainforest. There seemed to be a mosaic or mixed environment. Books by Robert Ardrey and others fleshed out the story of how he became human. Perhaps the best-selling of all was The Naked Ape by Desmond Morris, in which he gave a vivid, potted version of the ape into human transformation. The ancestors of The Naked Ape struck out, left the forest, and threw themselves into competition with the already efficiently adapted ground dwellers. With strong pressure on them to increase their prey-killing prowess, vital changes began to take place. They became more upright, faster, better runners, their hands became freed from locomotion duties, strong, efficient weapon holders, their brains became more complex, brighter, quicker decision makers. A hunting ape, a killer ape, was in the making. The story of the killer ape, of how we stood up and became mighty hunters spearing game across the plains of Africa, found a ready and eager audience. Perhaps it was the endless procession of war in the 20th century, from the First to the Second World Wars, and then Korea and Vietnam, that made the idea of a highly aggressive male going out to kill for the survival of his troop just all too believable. Certainly Raymond Dart, very much the alpha male anthropologist by the dawn of the 1960s, was keen to complete this picture of man, the ruthless carnivore, as he demonstrated in a television documentary of the period. The Australopithecines particularly liked the lower jaws of animals that had long canine teeth because these could be used as formidable weapons. And you can see how, with a weapon like this, they could gouge out the eyes of any animal. And even this primitive hyena jaw could rip up a belly. <laughs> A nice and simple, if rather bloodthirsty, story. Although, even 40 years later, it's still the basic account of early humans most commonly told in schools, it gradually became apparent through the 80s and 90s that the story was a bit oversimplified. We didn't head out from the forest and make a completely new life on the open plains, and we didn't make a simple switch from grazing on fruit to chasing down big game and eating their meat. Most significantly, the evidence that something was wrong with the story came from the very fossil beds in South Africa, where Raymond Dart had found the town child skull and set the savannah hare running. Philip Tobias had been a student of Dart's, and he had spent decades helping to fill out the standard account of our early ancestors as hunters on the plain, as had many other academics working in the developing field of paleoanthropology. But by 1995, the doubts were overwhelming. Just ten years ago, to a large London audience, with a histrionic gesture, I said the Savannah Hypothesis is no more. Open that window and throw it out at Sturkfontein and other South African sites and East African ones. These early hominids were all accompanied by woodland and forest species of plants and animals. Of course, if savanna is eliminated as a primary cause or selective advantage of going on two legs, then we are back to square one. Or not quite square one. There was an alternative account of how humans had come to be so different from their ape cousins, and it had been around for more than 30 years. It offered a single dramatic explanation for a large array of the physical characteristics that distinguish us from all the other apes our bipedal locomotion on two legs, our strange hairlessness, our layer of fat just beneath the skin, 
our big brain and unique language skills, as well as a host of other features, including the curious paradox that our noses are very large, but our sense of smell is comparatively poor. But in establishment circles, the alternative explanation was regarded as too bizarre and too radically different from the accepted Savannah story to be taken seriously. But why was it regarded as bizarre pseudoscience, and why did mainstream hostility continue for nearly 40 years? It was back in the late 60s that a young woman from the Welsh Valleys named Elaine Morgan, an award-winning playwright and journalist, came to read Desmond Morris's Naked Ape soon after it came out in 1967. Her initial reaction to it was one of simple irritation. She was a young wife and mother, and experiencing the trials of combining a writing career with raising her family. But the naked ape's description of the place of the female and the transition from ape to human struck her as all wrong. I started out of pure sort of irritation with people like Robert Audrey and Desmond Morris, not because of what they said, because they were only saying the same as all the scientists were saying, but they were popularizing it. And I wasn't a scientist, it was the popular version I was reading. And I thought that they were being very male-centered, and I thought it didn't work. And I disliked the way that female, everything about female was accounted for because of her need to suck up to the men so they'd give her a bit of meat, you know. And I thought, you wouldn't have a, a whole species evolving along such extraordinary lines for the benefit of the male, unless it was also at least not disadvantageous to the females. And I thought a lot of those things would have been disadvantageous to the females. I mean, they imagine these mighty hunters racing across after game and getting very hot and sweaty. So they shed their fur. So she's got to shed hers. But, I mean, she's not doing racing. She's sticking there. It gets very cold in the nights, doesn't it? I mean, the babies had something to cling to. She got all rid of that. I thought, you know, this was very maladaptive for her, and evolution doesn't work like that. There must be another explanation. So Elaine Morgan read The Naked Ape again, and this time she was struck by three short paragraphs on page 29. Desmond Morris had briefly described another, more ingenious theory that before he became a hunting ape, the original ground ape that had left the forests went through a long phase as an aquatic ape. When she contacted Morris to ask more about this ingenious theory, she learned that it had originally been put forward by an Oxford marine biologist, Sir Alistair Hardy, in an article in The New Scientist in 1960. The article was simply titled, Was Man More Aquatic in the Past? Hardy, in turn, had been influenced by the anatomical observations of Professor Wood Jones 30 years earlier, regarding the peculiar layer of fat tightly bonded to the skin that humans have and other primates lack. I read this in 1929, when I had recently returned from an Antarctic expedition where the layers of blubber of whales, seals, and penguins were such a feature of these examples of aquatic life. Such layers of fat are found in other water animals as well, and at once I thought perhaps man had been aquatic too. Later in the article, Hardy ventured that a shore-based environment might also help to explain man's upright posture and bipedal locomotion. My thesis is that a branch of this primitive ape stock was forced by competition from life in the trees to feed on the seashores and to hunt for food, shellfish, sea urchins, etc., in the shallow waters of the coast, wading about, at first paddling and toddling along the shores and the shallows, hunting for shellfish, man gradually went further and further into deeper water resting with his feet on the bottom and his head out of the surface, in fact, standing erect with the water supporting his weight. It seems to me likely that man learned to stand erect first in the water, and then, as his balance improved, he found he became better equipped for standing up on the shore when he came out, and indeed also for running. He would naturally have to return to the beach to sleep and to get water to drink, 
Actually, I imagine him to have spent at least half his time on land. My thesis is, of course, only a speculation, an hypothesis to be discussed and tested against further lines of evidence. Hardy wrote the New Scientist article because of a furore that he had inadvertently caused a month earlier. For thirty years, Hardy had sat on his aquatic ape idea because he knew it would impede his academic career and he wanted to make it to the top. But by 1960, he had made it to the top. So where was the harm? As Elaine Morgan explains. He never went public until the time came when he was a professor and he was a fellow of the Royal Society and he was getting old and so... But even then, he thought, well, I'll try it on the dog. He was invited to go and talk to a sub club and he thought, well, you know, I'll give him a little scientific slant on it and uh, nobody will ever hear about it, only these people here in this little room. But there was a reporter sitting in that little room who knew it was hot stuff, took it straight to Fleet Street, and all the Sunday papers, Oxford professor says man is a sea ape. And the balloon went up and he got back to Oxford and Wilfred Laveau Clark rang him up and said, Alistair, never do that again. Because <laughs> he was <laughs> exposing the whole profession to ridicule. And I wrote to him and asked whether it would be all right if I wrote this book quoting his theory. His first reaction was, well, you know, I'm thinking one, I might write it up myself sometime. Then I got another letter saying, I've talked to my publisher about it, and he thinks it would be a good idea if a more popular version came out in advance, you know, to clear the way for it. So go ahead with my blessing. So I did, I went ahead with his blessing. But his never came out. He was an outsider to the extent that his field was marine biology and not anthropology, so they held that against him as well. One might think it odd that an eminent marine biologist and fellow of the Royal Society would be barred as an outsider from venturing some observations about human evolution. But academic boundaries can be fiercely patrolled. And if Hardy was regarded as beyond the pale, what of Elaine Morgan? She wasn't an anthropologist either. She wasn't even a scientist. But she was a brilliant writer, with an Oxford degree in English, and most of all, an indefatigably inquiring mind. So she wrote her book in the form of an account from the female point of view of what might have happened to make us human. And it was an instant success. So much so, that in 1972 she was invited on a publicity tour of the United States, appearing on television and radio chat shows across the continent to talk about the proposal of an aquatic phase in human evolution. And what did Sir Alistair Hardy make of it? I rang him up to say that my book had been accepted, and he said, what's it called? And I said, it's called The Descent of Woman. Long silence. The Descent of what? <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, for him, the water had no connection with, with him at all. And he, anyway, it did come out, and he was sent a complimentary copy. He sent me a telegram in New York saying, brilliant. And, uh, of course, he wrote a foreword to the next book I wrote. But a best-selling book is one thing. Academic acceptance is quite another. It was still 20 years before Philip Tobias would stand up to declare the Savannah theory dead. And professional anthropologists liked the idea of the aquatic ape theory even less coming from Elaine Morgan than they had when it came from Sir Alistair Hardy. It didn't matter that she had researched the subject in great depth and added a number of other human characteristics to Hardy's original three or so that would seem to point to an aquatic shore-based past. If anything, the accumulation of further detail that she had painstakingly carried out made the anthropologists dig their heels in all the more firmly. The scientific reaction was bitter anger and contempt. I mean, it was very hard on them. I wasn't qualified. She doesn't even know that when you write Homo sapiens, it's got to have a capital letter and a small letter and be in italics. And she, she talks once about canines. And she means dogs, but I mean canines are teeth. <laughs> How stupid can she get? But I've had some very nice experiences since then. Dan Dennett invited me over to go to Tufts University in Boston, and people from Harvard came to it, and I got a very, very good reception there.
I brought her over to give a talk at Tufts, the only time I've met her. And in a packed hall, she entranced everybody and absolutely pushed one anthropologist over the brink. And he responded with uh, emotional declarations that were really, in the end, hilarious. And she handled them very deftly. It was as if she had planted him in the audience. <laughs> it was a stunning demonstration of the sort of irrational hostility that she engenders, and she parried it brilliantly, and the audience was in her pocket. Dan Dennett is Professor of Philosophy at Tufts University in Boston. He's also the author of a number of highly acclaimed books on aspects of evolution, including Darwin's Dangerous Idea, in which he touched on the curious reluctance of scientists to engage seriously with the aquatic ape hypothesis, either to embrace it or to refute it. If I were the one of the chief architects and defenders of, a, of an establishment theory in any field, and a grandmotherly journalist were to propose the idea that the theory was wrong, I would be a little unsettled, and it would be hard to maintain my cool. I've seen level-headed, calm, serious scientists get quite flabbergasted and unable to express themselves in their discomfort with the aquatic ape theory. I'm really surprised, in a way, that there hasn't been the right sort of measured and sober response. At least if there, if there has been, I haven't been able to find it. Professor Graham Richards of the British Psychological Society was similarly intrigued by the failure of the scientific establishment to address the aquatic ape with due seriousness. The fact that Alistair Hardy and especially Elaine Morgan were both outsiders to the field of paleoanthropology had clearly provoked not just a prudent scientific caution, but something more visceral, even jealousy. One of the reasons, I think, for um, early hostility to it was purely a feeling that, well, why didn't one of us come up with that? If it was true, one of us would have come up with it first. It was a kind of incredulity, almost, that this outsider could produce this theory, which seemed to pull so many threads together. But there was also a feeling that they were all glancing around the room, feeling, well, I can't personally uh, think of the knockdown argument, but surely one of you can, and then I think, well, which one of us is it has got the knockdown argument? And it gradually became apparent that none of them had the knockdown argument. And so they resorted to this kind of rhetoric about, oh, she's cobbled together a kind of collage of different facts and figures, which is exactly what scientific theories are supposed to do. You know, why was Newton's theory of gravity so important? Because it integrated everything from why the moon went around the earth to why apples fall. That is the key thing of a good scientific theory that it does this linking job on a lot of phenomena that were hitherto thought to be totally unrelated. And whatever the long-term merits of the theory are judged to be, it certainly did that. Conscious of the accusations that she wasn't a scientist, Elaine Morgan went on to write four more books on the subject of humanity's aquatic past, each, as she says, more po-faced than the last, providing notes, referencing every citation, dotting I's and crossing T's, and increasingly laudatory reviews came in from ever more august journals, from the British Medical Journal. Elaine Morgan seems to have succeeded where the professionals have failed. She has made a genuine contribution to evolutionary theory, which synthesizes research from a wide range of scientific disciplines. From the annals of human biology. My views about her latest book, and what she was trying to achieve by writing it changed completely while I was reading it. It deserves to be read seriously. And an enthusiastic review from the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute in 1990 ended with the tolling of a warning bell. The cost of conceding to Morgan would be a paleological crisis as profound as that of the Earth scientists when adjusting to the equally impossible idea of floating continents. The reviewer was referring to the theory of Alfred Wegener that the continents of the Earth are drifting apart. As a meteorologist, Wegener was also a classic outsider, and his theory was roundly ridiculed and rejected by geologists for over 30 years. 
But when the submarine research in the 1960s finally proved that the Atlantic seafloor really was spreading apart, hostility faded and Wegener's plate tectonics became the accepted paradigm. So what of the aquatic ape theory? Will it too finally be endorsed as a paradigm account of how we became human? For 30 years, the anthropologists have maintained closed ranks and either ignored it, denounced it as bizarre, or said simply there's no testable evidence, no equivalent to the spreading sea floor. But now it would appear that the missing evidence is finally appearing. And in next week's program, we will look at some of the evidence and see where it leads. Meanwhile, the mainstream anthropologist's view of where humans really grew up appears to be moving hesitantly down to the seashores. If not in a headlong rush, at least with the gingerly placing of a toe in the water. Indeed, in much the same way, one might say, that those earliest ancestral apes probably did too on first arriving at the coast. Leslie Ayer. If we're talking about humans using aquatic resources, uh, shellfish, fishing, living in lakeshore or seashore environments, there's every reason to believe they did that at specific phases you know, throughout our evolutionary history. But, you know, if we're talking about myself believing in an aquatic hypothesis, I would say I only believe in an aquatic hypothesis if I can define exactly when in the evolutionary period I think hominids were, were using aquatic resources and how our uh, anatomy or behavior may have been molded or reflected by that. But, you know, there is no one aquatic hypothesis. It, it, it depends what you mean by semi-aquatic. Do, do you mean having one toe in the water? Or? When Raymond Dart said, I found a skull, and I think it's not quite a chimp, took 30 years before they believed him, and Wegener said, I think the continents have moved. Rubbish! Shout it down in Harvard. 30 years later, yes, you're right. So I thought, I'd give it 30 years. Well, now it's had 32. <laughs> there is no one aquatic hypothesis. It depends what you mean by semi-aquatic. Do, do you mean having one toe in the water? In the first program, we traced the history of reactions to the aquatic ape hypothesis, as first suggested by Sir Alistair Hardy in 1960, and then fully developed by the writer Elaine Morgan. The hypothesis claims that the features that distinguish humans from other apes, standing upright, naked and sweaty, swimming and diving with our very fat babies, big brain and language skills, are best explained as water adaptations. In other words, that we diverged from the other apes by moving to a lake and seashore environmental niche for a considerable length of time in prehistory. For how long exactly, where and when it occurred, whether indeed it has ever stopped, are all open questions. But what is increasingly agreed is that the exploitation of aquatic resources was an essential component of early human evolution. For 40 or more years, the accepted crucible of humanity was the open savanna grassland of Africa, and the aquatic alternative was ridiculed. Then, really since the early 90s, the consensus began to fall apart. Why? What new evidence has come to the fore in the last ten or so years to cause such a paradigm shift? To drive the anthropological mainstream off the savannah and, with a certain amount of pushing and shoving and cautious hesitation, down to the water's edge. We'll start with the brain. It was manifestly clear that this idea of Homo sapiens evolving a big brain through fierce competition on the savannas of Africa with the big cats and all the rest of it was just rubbish. I mean, there was absolutely no parallel example 
of evolution of a brain on the savannas. Every single species, without exception, lost its relative brain size as it evolved bigger. Professor Michael Crawford of the Institute of Brain Chemistry and Human Nutrition in London. When we came to do the studies on the reasons why there were different sizes of brains in different animals and realised that the, really the brain required fats, 60% of the structural material was fats, so where did these fats come from? When we did these studies, it all sort of fitted together. Michael Crawford and his team had established two crucial facts. First, that the brains of all other savannah animals had shrunk in relative size as they evolved larger bodies. By contrast, the human brain had grown threefold. But secondly, and more importantly, they demonstrated that to evolve a larger brain, you need an abundant supply of omega-3 fatty acids, especially DHA, but also, crucially, iodine. And the only place to find that accessible and abundant supply of brain-selected nutrients was at the shoreline in the marine food chain. When one compares the land base with this universal collapse of brain size with what goes on in the marine system, I mean, you've got the dolphin, which is about the same body weight as a zebra, and the zebra's got about 360, 70 grams of brain in its head. The dolphin's got 1.8 kilograms. You know, it's just phenomenal. The only way Homo sapiens could end up today with 2% of his body mass as brain would be to find an ecological resource that would provide him with the nutrients that are required for the brain to grow. And the only place you can do that is at the coastlines. Some researchers were still sceptical. They suggested that the brains and the bone marrow of big game on the savannah might supply the essential DHA. But if that were the case, then surely the dominant predators, the big cats, far better equipped than a small fruit-eating hominid ape to crunch through bones and skulls, would have got into the brain and marrow first and thereby grown their own big brains. Well, they hadn't. Believe you me, if, if you want to try and get the brain out of a buffalo skull, you're going to need a hacksaw to do it. It's no joke, and it would certainly have not gone round a tribe, for argument's sake. And by the time you got it home to your where the women were, it would probably have festered and be foul. Whereas, by contrast, it would be totally natural for a woman at that time, even heavily pregnant, which is the most important physiological time for brain development, to be able to walk around the coastline and pick up food, because at that time it would have been incredibly rich, the richest food resource on the planet on your doorstep. Dr. Stephen Canane worked with Professor Crawford in the 1980s and 90s, unravelling the story of how the large human brain came about. He was increasingly struck by another curious feature of humans, that our babies are quite extraordinarily fat. Newborn chimps and gorillas, by contrast, have no fat at all. Our babies have a tenfold increase in fat in the last 12 weeks before birth. A tenfold increase in their total body fat. So you're talking about 30% of that baby's weight is brain and body fat. Now a chimpanzee's brain is almost as big as an infant's brain at birth, but it has no body fat to speak of whatsoever. So it abandons brain expansion at birth because it can't run it. By contrast, the human brain trebles in size from birth to around age 10. And there's another persuasive aspect to the theory. It's predictive. It predicts that because iodine and other nutrients in the marine food chain are essential to the evolution of the human brain, then if we switch to a new land-based diet that is poor in those nutrients, brain function will suffer. And that's exactly what has happened. According to the World Health Organization report in 2004, iodine deficiency amongst inland populations affects around 740 million people worldwide. In Karela, the school children, 60% of them, are iodine deficient. I saw exactly the same in Indonesia, where I was there for the World Health Organization. 60% of the school children, the same number, have palpable goiter. But we've got to the fishing villages, not one. 
So this movement in land, which has happened as a consequence of population expansion, uh, has brought about uh, some serious degenerative disorders. Even for pillars of the anthropological mainstream, including former editor of the Journal of Human Evolution, Professor Leslie Aiello, the marine food chain account of brain evolution is becoming compelling. And it's tied up with another compelling story of migrations. Personally, I feel that the dietary and nutrition side of things would be a very interesting area to research further because there's many convincing arguments that migration would be easier along the seashore type of environment. But, you know, we need to be able to address the features. We need to be able to test them in a scientific manner. Mark Verhagen, a Belgian medical physician who has researched and published widely in support of the aquatic ape hypothesis, describes the boom years of the Homo erectus dispersal across the globe. This early hominid relative of ours arguably experienced greater brain growth than any other branch of the hominid family tree. About 1.8 million years ago, we suddenly find fossils of Homo all along the warm coasts of the Old World. We find them from Algeria, Ein Hanich, over the Manisi in Georgia, to Iran they have found tools near a paleo lake, a large paleo lake, until Java, Mojokerto. So suddenly, 1.8 million years ago, we find them everywhere. But why did it happen then? Was there an environmental catastrophe, or perhaps a population boom, that drove these early bipedal hominids first to the beach and then around the coastlines? What pushed them? Well, I don't think it was a push. It was, perhaps you can better call it a pull. It was an opportunity. I, I see it like this, at the beginning of the ice ages there was enormous amounts of water that were kept as ice at the poles and so there was a drop of 100 meters and more of the sea level and on the continental shelf there came enormous space, free, probably abundant in uh, aquatic in, in shellfish and crabs and so on, that was uh, simply an opportunity for our ancestors. And the story took a dramatic step further in October last year, when newspapers across the world put a startling image on their front pages. It was a picture of Homo floresiensis, a curiously small hominid fossil discovered on the Indonesian island of Flores. The adult was only three feet tall. Mike Moorwood and his colleagues, who made the extraordinary discovery, nicknamed it The Hobbit. But from one perspective, this hobbit skeleton, dated to 12,000 years ago, was just a follow-up, albeit an odd one, to another remarkable find by the same team a few years earlier. Peter Brown is Professor of Archaeology and a lead member of the team. On Flores we have a site called Mata Mengo, where there are stone tools dated to 840,000 years ago. So it looks like some tool-making biped got to Flores at least by 840 and perhaps earlier in time than that. The concern was never so much the date but how they got to Flores, this small island, and on the evidence we have Flores was always an island. Maybe they were stegodon jockeys, maybe they rode on the backs of elephants between the islands. Unlikely, I, I, I would have thought. They could have built watercraft and come from, from island to island. If you can see the next island, I suppose it's possible or it could have been an accidental process. And in the 1930s, a man called Wood Jones said Australia was populated by a pregnant woman on a log with a dog. And obviously it takes more than one pregnant woman on a log to populate an island, but it could have just been an accidental process rather than intentional building of boats. We, we will never really know, but what we appear to be certain of is that water had to be crossed to get there. As the decades pass and the evidence accumulates from sometimes unexpected directions, Elaine Morgan is still going strong. At 84, and with a new book out, she doesn't see any difficulty with getting to Flores. They said maybe we were riding on the backs of elephants, or else we drifted across on some kind of craft. But if you're an anthropoid ape, or some variation of an anthropoid ape, 
You don't get to construct crafts unless you're very confident in the water already. I'm quite happy with crafts. I also think that at that stage we would have been perfectly capable of swimming across. Swimming. When did humans learn this considerable skill? Professor Erika Shegatay, an authority in apneic breath control, would argue that we learn it at about the same time as we learn to dive in water. And if you consider what you have to do to skin dive, well, most importantly, you have to hold your breath, then you find something very interesting. In land mammals, including our primate cousins, the chimps and gorillas, breathing is entirely involuntary. You can't get a chimp to hold his breath. Breathing is as unconscious as the beat of its heart. And it is for us humans, too, a lot of the time. Most of the time, our breathing is completely automatic. It's uh, not something we have to think about. For instance, when we sleep, our breathing pattern is completely run by autonomous systems of the brain. We don't stop breathing when we sleep. But there are other times, for example, right now, as I'm talking to you, and perhaps I might want to emphasize a particular word, I then switch to voluntary, conscious control of my breathing. It's second nature, and we do it all the time. But it gets even more intriguing when we look at the fully committed aquatic mammals like dolphins. Dolphins and some whales have actually lost the ability to switch back again from conscious breathing to unconscious breathing. One might ask then, so how do they sleep? Well, it's fascinating. Brain scans of dolphins show that when they sleep, and they sleep for a very typical mammalian eight hours a day, they can only let one half of their brain go to sleep at any one time. They have to keep the other half awake to ensure that they surface regularly for a breath of air. So there's a fantastic symmetry to how the whole range of mammals handle breathing. Fully aquatic, exclusively conscious, fully land-based, exclusively unconscious. But semi-aquatic, we can switch between the two as and when it suits us. And if you want support for this idea that expert breath control is necessary for speech, just listen to this. Hey, oh yeah. Hey, oh yeah. Hey, 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 wow. It's the voice of Hoover, a popular character in Boston who had a two column obituary in the Globe and Mail when sadly he passed away in 1985. <laughs> Hoover died at the grand old age of 14. You see, Hoover was a harbour seal. It said he was the only non-human mammal ever to make the sounds of human speech. By all accounts, he learnt the phrases from the couple who rescued him as an orphan in 1971, George and Alice Swallow, and who raised him for the first few months in their bath. <laughs> Not everyone, however, is convinced about which came first, speech or swimming. Professor Leslie Aiello. Language is obviously one of the primary human adaptations, and breath control is essential to language. But breath control can be used for other things as well as language. One of them is swimming. So our ability to swim, controlling our breath and all, might be just the byproduct of our ability to speak. It's as reasonable of a hypothesis as turning it around and saying we can speak because we went swimming. Well, it's an interesting possibility. What we do know is that both the diving response and natural swimming abilities are displayed extremely early in the growth of the human infant. Indeed, they are strongest at birth. In the Indonesian uh, Sokolawut water people, the traditional way of giving birth was to go in the sea. But the missionaries now tried to make this population stop. They were still trying to practice it because they knew it was so much easier for, for the women to give birth in water. And also the children, of course, they are baby swimming from very early age, and they swim and dive very well before they can walk. 
Lots of people get very worried that if a baby's born underwater, it's going to drown because the first human response is to want to take a deep breath. But human beings are amazing. When they're born, they still have intact the diving reflex, or we call the duck reflex, which means if there's water on the face, there's receptors on the face that will close the throat off. So actually, the baby will not inhale water. Once air hits the baby's face, the receptors will trigger off the breathing response and then the baby will take the deepest breaths it will ever take for its whole life. So the baby's quite safe to be born underwater. The longest I've seen a baby underwater was probably about a minute and that's quite a long time, a minute. Susan Burville is consultant midwife at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. With many years' experience of training midwives in water birthing, she's still impressed at how very comfortable humans are both mother and baby, with giving birth in water. Often water birth babies seem to be very relaxed at a birth that's been underwater. They come to the surface, they take their first initial deep breaths, and then they settle quite quickly, and the mother holds the baby skin to skin. The cord, which is still attached to the placenta, in most cases is just long enough for the mother to bring the baby to the breast. So again, evolution has worked really well in our favour. So if the mother was on her own in a river, for example, she doesn't need anyone to help her, she can bring the baby to the breast. It seems extraordinary that humans, reputedly a land mammal, should find giving birth in water a perfectly natural thing to do. Professor Peter Wheeler, Dean of Science at Liverpool John Moores University, is a leading opponent of the aquatic ape hypothesis and has argued for many years that it's misguided and wrong. He believes that giving birth in water could not be an evolutionary adaptation because it would be simply too cold for the baby. Human babies lose heat very easily because they are so small. They have a high surface area to volume ratio. Um, and even in air, they'll start to lose body heat or additional body heat at temperatures as low as 33, 34 degrees centigrade, just a few degrees below body temperature. So... Even in air, they've got problems. In water, the problems are even greater. The baby will have to start producing heat, maybe just one or two degrees below body temperature. And if water temperature falls a couple of degrees below that, they can't maintain enough body heat production to maintain their temperature at a, at a stable level, and very soon they'll die. So when you see pictures of babies swimming around in water, it's, it's warm water. They, in the sort of temperatures you get in natural water bodies in the sea, they would die very quickly. Susan Burville, as a consultant midwife, is more worried about the opposite problem. What we do know when there has been some problems with babies needing to go to special care is often the water's been too hot. But when I was talking to some of the home birth midwives in Moscow recently, a couple of them were taking women to the Black Sea where they, the women would go up to waist height and maybe crouch down with support and then give birth to their babies underwater in the summer in the Black Sea. Often the temperature was down to 19, 20 degrees, which for me would be quite chilly. There is one other odd feature of human birth. It's so odd, indeed it's thought to be unique to humans, that it's not much studied or written about in the medical literature. It's called vernix caseosa, Latin for cheesy varnish and it's the name of the fatty, greasy coating on the skin of the human infant when it's born. From a midwifery perspective, if I saw a baby come out, either on land or water, with a lot of vernix over its whole body, I may be a little bit concerned if we've got the gestation, the length of the pregnancy right. In other words, if the baby has an excess of vernix all over at birth, it's probably a sign that it's slightly premature. It's been suggested that it waterproofs the skin while it's submerged in the amniotic fluid in utero. But if so, then surely all unborn mammals would get this protection. But they don't. Apparently, it's only human babies who arrive covered in a layer of grease, looking, as Elaine Morgan described it, rather like a cross-channel swimmer. Dr. Peter Jackson veterinary obstetrician at Cambridge University for 30 years, has written... As far as I know, vernix caseosa is a purely human condition, and I do not believe that it occurs in neonatal animals. It's interesting that it does not occur in any of the other primates except human beings. Looking for vernix in animals produces no references. Now, over the years, 
One of the arguments put against the aquatic ape hypothesis is that it makes no testable predictions. But this case of the apparent uniqueness of Vernix seemed more and more intriguing. Could it really be unique? And why would it be so? And moreover, a possible test suggested itself. If entering water during labour really is a semi-aquatic evolutionary adaptation of some antiquity and not a recent fad of civilised societies, then one could make a prediction. Other semi-aquatic mammals should have it too. Mammals that either give birth in water or swim soon after being born would also have a coating of vernix. So in the course of making these programmes, we've scoured the scientific literature. Nothing. We contacted professors of mammalian physiology in Europe, Japan and the United States. Nothing. Vernix really was unique to humans. We wrote to marine biologists in Norway, Russia and Alaska. They reported back that they'd never seen it. It was a dead end, a human curiosity. Then, just a month ago, a week before we finished recording, we got a call. Professor Don Bowen in Nova Scotia, northern Canada. For a period of about 10 years, we had uh, an opportunity to handle newborn harbor seals on a regular basis. And certainly, if you do handle one within um, minutes or, or so of birth, they are covered with this waxy substance. It's very noticeable. In fact, if you handle a pup with bare hands and your hands are, are coated with it, and it's, uh, it's all over the entire uh, body of the animal. Harbor seals enter the water usually uh, within about a half an hour to an hour of birth and are, are able to swim with their mothers uh, almost immediately. I mean, we always assumed that it was analogous to the vernix that uh, humans are born with. We actually never pursued it uh, in a systematic way. Now, this is pretty interesting. For as far as we are aware, it's the first time that vernix has ever been reported in an animal other than humans. So, do other species of seal have vernix as well? Gray seals do, but the concentration is noticeably less. Uh, that is, if you handle a newborn gray seal, you can feel a slight waxiness to the fur, but, but certainly the concentration of vernix is, is much less than it is on harbor seals. And in hooded seals, it seems to be even less so. The concentration uh, is noticeably reduced compared to uh, even gray seals. They probably, on average, don't enter the water until they're you know, a week or ten days old. These are only observations and have not been systematically studied and written up. But from what Professor Bowen reports, there appears to be some basic correlation between the amount of vernix on an infant at birth and how soon it takes to the water. It would almost seem to be a case of the thicker, the quicker. Certainly spotted seals and some of the other small coasted seals in the North Pacific, I would assume, have it, but nobody's really reported it. It is something that I think is, um, is fascinating and uh, we'll uh, very much like to follow it up. Over these two programs, We've tried to trace the history of the aquatic ape hypothesis to see how reactions to it have changed over the last 45 years. Although it still provokes fierce debate, the evidence, bit by bit and year by year, really does seem to be accumulating in its favour. Perhaps, like Wegener and his continental drift, the tide really is turning toward Alistair Hardy and Elaine Morgan and their proposal that our earliest human ancestors were born not on the grasslands or the forest, but in the shallows and lagoons at the margin between sea and land. Last year, a book was published by two very eminent and mainstream paleoanthropologists, David Cameron and Colin Groves, in which they state, At first, the aquatic ape hypothesis was simply ignored as grotesque and perhaps unworthy of discussion because proposed by an amateur. But Morgan's latest arguments have reached a sophistication that simply demands to be taken seriously. I'm not totally against it, but I'm not for it either. I think the take-home message on this is, you know, as with anything, there's probably kernels of truth. I think in ten years, we'll be over the cusp. 
the tide is beginning to drift in that direction and I think it'll pick up speed and I think that a lot of people will bring up their own reasons why they think that the difference between man and the apes had something to do with water. I go no further than that, but they all seem to be trickling in that direction. And I don't know whether it'll be alive to see it, but I'm confident it is going to come. Scars of Evolution was presented by David Attenborough. It was produced by Richard Collins and is a Monty Funk production for BBC Radio 4.